Greetings. I'd like to come to share more about a new offering that I am gifting forth on my website. This hotly requested intensive dive into all the myths and mysteries of clitoral orgasm. As they say, truth is stranger than fiction. So despite all the myths that we will be debunking and demystifying in this container, the mysteries of clitoral orgasm are that much more magical and fascinating. Before we get into that, however, I would like to just share a brief epiphany that I had this morning. When we take the time to be present and to welcome opportunities to acknowledge blessings of revelation in even the most mundane occurrences, we are truly enriched by divine wisdom that makes itself manifest in such beauty and harmony in every aspect of the world around us. <clears throat> One of my affirmations is, I'm always in the right place at the right time to receive and recognize blessings. Many times we receive blessings. However, we must ask for the grace of discernment to recognize blessings when they come, even in the most seemingly innocuous circumstances or through the most overlooked and underestimated individuals. So uh, walking my children to school here in New England, I'm, you know, I'm a Southern girl, so New England is not very kind for my body. <laughs> Uh, most of the year, but finally spring has arrived in all its beauty. And one thing about New England is um, the, the flowers and the gardens that individuals take the time to cultivate and curate um, are very beautiful. And I often take the time to pause and take in the beauty of the flowers that I see along the way to appreciate the beautiful impermanence of life. Life is all the more poignant by its fleeting nature as is beauty. Um, beauty is all the more powerful because of its impermanence. And um, like the delicacy and fragility of flowers women's beauty and femininity is that much more cherished because of its delicacy and how quickly fleeting it is, as the scripture says. Um, <laughs> beauty is fleeting and vain. Not vain in the sense of narcissistic self-indulgence or self-aggrandizement, but vain in the sense of how fleeting it is, even illusory, the illusion of it. That being an illusion is no less comforting and affirming and uplifting, right? So taking my children to school uh, on the way back, my youngest daughter, who stays at home with me, she was picking flowers for me, which she does every day. And I placed them on my sacred table by sacred space that I've been so blessed to cultivate. And it's so simple to intend and choose to cultivate sacredness, no matter what your environment looks like, no matter what or who's around you or what you have to do. It only takes a brief moment to consciously intend to cultivate sacredness and create a little, a little nook and cranny of sacred space 
within your home, within your room, even if it's just a corner of your closet that you beautify. Um, it's always refreshing and innovating to visit a spot of sacredness throughout every day. And uh, just as my daughter gives me beautiful offerings of flowers every day, it reminds me to feed into and nourish and offer to the divine feminine within me, to honor the divine mother within me as a mother, as my daughter is showing me how she honors me and loves me through her sweet, innocent offerings. And uh, so I, I see so many beautiful purple and yellow flowers, which are both two of my favorite colors. The yellow reminds me of joy and creativity, sensuality and the, the sacral chakra. And the purple uh, is indicative of loyalty, um, intuition, uh, clarity of sight and divine manifestation. So as I'm pondering these flowers uh, that my daughter has placed in my hands as we're walking, she sees the, um, the name escapes me right now, but the dandelions, not the dandelions, um, the willows, not the weeping willow tree, but I think they're, they're called willows. Um, you know, the little fuzzy flowers that you blow and as children were told to blow them and make a wish. And <laughs> I was affirming with her and, you know, letting her know that, um, you know, prayers, prayers are the affirmative, actionable, um, spoken utterance of manifestation. And so what she speaks as prayer is more empowering and powerful to manifest than saying, oh, I wish, you know, a lot of times we say, I wish this would happen. But even that has an attached connotation of doubt. And prayer is a, an act of surrender, giving to the all-encompassing, omnipresent, all-powerful, vastness and majesty of the divine, the creator, the universe itself, the most high. And when we surrender, especially as part of our feminine embodiment, our daily feminine embodiment, devotion enhances our femininity, our softness, our ability to surrender and be open to receive. And that is our divine gift of magnetism as women, men have a different path. And we'll talk about that later. So in prayer, we surrender um, just as we lay ourselves vulnerable and naked before our lovers, before our spouses, before our husbands, in perfect love and perfect trust. Prayer is another form of that intimacy, opening and spreading ourselves humble and vulnerable, receiving and saying yes, I know that you are covering me, you are caring for me, and I know that the desires of my heart you will provide. Just as the divine masculine, even in earthly physical form, a man who truly is, is invigorated by your femininity, he will do and give whatever you ask. Asking you shall receive. And prayer is that acknowledgement of the surety and providence of divine masculinity as the most high, the ultimate father, provider, protector, husband, beloved. The beloved that the soul longs for, continuously desires union with, and is joyfully co-creating life with, and that is prayer, co-creation. As we utter our desires, we acknowledge and accept and affirm that they are already done. It's not entitlement in the sense of the modern woman feeling entitled 
for, you know, a man to pay her bills or patronize her OnlyFans or women who feel that just because they are a woman that they deserve a man's hard-earned labor and the sweat of his brow, regardless of the inner work she's done or hasn't done. Um, expectation is not the same as entitlement. Expectation is the knowing that your desire is already fulfilled and the waiting on the advent of its manifestation in grace. Uh, the faith in things yet unseen and the unseen is the woman, it is the womb. It is, our wombs are these vortexes, these cauldrons stirring up desires and imagination that will then be directed by light energy, masculine energy, into realization, fulfillment, and manifestation to our satisfaction. From the unseen into the seen, we are the carriers of the unseen, the creative potential, potential energy, and the masculine kinetic energy directs that into motion, into action, into electricity, light, into the seen. And prayer is this divine lovemaking. Prayer itself is masculinity and femininity come together in Congress and sacred dance through the aphrodisiac powers of vulnerability, shared vulnerability, shared trust. We trust as the divine feminine that our needs and desires will be fulfilled. And the masculine trusts in our devotion in our softness, in our allowing him to take care of our needs. So um, as uh, my daughter and I were praying, saying prayers and affirmations and blowing, the willow seeds fluttering in the sky, I thought about the power of even visualizing those desires as each little petal floating through and <laughs> that that energy, the breath energy, the sacred breath of the most high that was breathed into the first created man and woman, the animating force, the ashe, the chi, that which distinguishes us especially from the rest of creation. What is that special spark? that makes us truly human and divine at the same time it is that breath, that sacred breath of the most high. And that breath fuels the sound vibrations of manifestation. Therefore, all creation came from an utterance, a vibration attached to the breath. That's why mindfulness and the mindfulness of being attentive to your breath is so important in yoga and tantra and all these traditions. Mantra in tantra is so important as my beautiful sister goddess um, teacher, uh, well, she doesn't like to be referred to as a teacher, but a guide, a vessel, a beautiful, uh, beautiful sister, priestess, Aja Shah, otherwise known as Soleil. She is the patroness, the patron priestess of the goddess temple of love. And uh, she always reminds everyone that there would be no tantra without mantra and yantra. And the power of the breath invigorates the power of the sound that manifests. Even in the beginning in scripture, when he said what is to be, and it was, and it is, that was the divine utterance that manifested all of creation. The big bang that scientists speak of was the utterance of the voice of the Most High reverberating throughout 
the nameless void that in itself is mother's womb, the primal void, the triple darkness of potential that holds everything, just as all light comes from darkness, all potential, everything we can conceive to imagine comes from that dark hidden place, swirling in creative potentiality, like the pot, the cauldron, that has always been a totem of womanhood. Women in their kitchen stirring pots. Big mama with that big old gumbo pot with everything thrown in there mixed up, right? Stews and soups that are naturally so nourishing to most humans, right? Um, in all cultures, there's some hearty stew or soup that we all just love, right? That is the mother. <laughs> that is everything mixed up. Potentials and imagination, creativity and sensuality, which cooking is a very sensual, creative feminine act, not a drudging burden as feminists would have you believe. So that pot, that cauldron, that chalice into which is mixed all the potential of imagination and creativity poured out and transmuted into light energy directed linearly into the seeing manifestation. That is alchemy, that is sex, that is masculine and feminine union, period. Um, so that's why the breath is so important for sound. There would be no sound either without air through which to travel. When we breathe, even the breath itself makes subtle sound. It's a vibration of expectation and anticipation. So the breath of life, the Ruach in Hebrew, which incidentally also means not only breath of the body, but intellect, thoughts. And when we think of the electromagnetic energy of all of our thoughts individually and collectively that is literally floating through the air right now, palpable and measurable, just like the wind that we cannot see but it is real. Ruach also means spirit. Hence the Holy Spirit is the Ruach HaKodesh, the sacred spirit. The Ruach set apart, set apart. Just like this space is set apart, Kodesh, set apart from the rest of the mundane things in my home right, that are easily looked over, you know. Um, but it's set apart, this space is sacred to me. It is set apart, it is where I can be mindful and look, even just to physically look at it. It reminds me of beauty and sensuality. It reminds me of stillness and devotion. Just like a bride is set apart from other women. precious and cherished by her husband, above and beyond anything and everything in this world, set apart, set on a pedestal, on a throne, enshrined behind a veil to protect that treasure. The Ruach HaKodesh the set-apart spirit, the set-apart breath, <laughs> because it distinguishes us as mankind from the rest of creation. That special intelligence, that special intuition, that special divine spark in every human that animates us from being just mere flesh and biological impulses. Mm. 
So when we pray and we blow, blow those flowers. That breath carries the prayer all around to the universe. And I can even imagine and visualize and meditate upon each little seed blowing in the wind, almost as emissaries or angels themselves going across and around the universe to gather up resources and even people that will conspire and convolute and converge together to help and assist in manifesting that which I asked for. So I hope that made sense. That was my little revelation this morning. Uh, so, so I'm here to share about my new offering, Overcome Myths of Clitoral Orgasm or Demystifying Clitoral Orgasm. Many women are conditioned to desensitize their yonis and their wombs through an over-dependence on clitoral orgasm or fail to achieve orgasm altogether, even through clitoral stimulation because of hypersensitivity and even pain that they may feel when touching their clitoris. There are many fears and performance anxieties that women experience concerning orgasm and sexual performance. And I'm here to, to assuage those ambivalences and to heal some of that trauma um, and those trauma-informed programs that have been passed down. We have to think as women of our mother's stories, you know, how accessible was their pleasure? And the history is particularly for women of the diaspora, Black women, African-American women, um, Dis, uh, African descent women, BIPOC women, Black Indigenous people of color. We have a specific unraveling of layers and layers and layers of generational trauma that is specifically nuanced from uh, being kidnapped and enslaved, tortured, and mutilated, exterminated, experimented on. Uh, there's so many horrors and atrocities. Our ma'afa, our Holocaust, that continues to this day through many insidious agendas uh, and systematic efforts. So unraveling that, we are able to find the depths of pleasure. And this course is to assist in that, to assist in learning the different levels of orgasm, which include the G spot, the A spot, the U spot, crygasms, <laughs> laughgasms, energetic orgasms. We, um, we come together to explore histories of vaginal armoring, which leads to psychological shame and emotional repression, as well as physical blockages. Wilhelm Reich uh, theorized about genital armoring, which applies to men and women. But if here, here, of course, we'll, we'll be referring to vaginal armoring and de-armoring. And uh, basically, I'll go up more into that in the course, but, you know, armoring comes from shame enforced by things like um, childhood shaming when as a tiny child, pre-toddler, your hand may have ventured to your genitals and somebody smacked your hand and startled you. You know, those things, as small and innocuous as they may seem, which we may not even remember, the body remembers everything. The body remembers that shock. 
that feeling of something wrong. Even the pain of that slap and that tap, the feeling of betrayal from one's caretaker or adult, the feeling of confusion, what did I do? Isn't this the same as touching my arm, my face, my nose? The confusion about what one did to receive such pain and alarm and shame being shamed for exploring our bodies very, very young, um, masturbating and someone busting in the room <laughs> and shaming you for that. All of these incidences, as much as we may even laugh about it as adults or may have even forgotten it, the body remembers that, the, the soul remembers that. And it literally leads to actual physical hardening and desensitization where you create stories and programs of being unworthy of pleasure and this can contribute to many difficulties to, to orgasm and of course orgasm is not some destination it's not some final climax it is the journey of presentness it is the journey of surrender it is the journey of deep connectedness in which all ego is lost, renounced, forsaken, and you are rebirthed in total oneness, which is so divine, where your lover is a priest to your soul, a high priest ushering you into initiations through that pleasure into deeper intuition, deeper awareness, deeper transcendence, deeper embodiment. Simultaneously, we transcend the body while simultaneously deepening our embodiment in the body, recognizing the divinity in the body as it was created with such meticulous order that even the most profound scientists still to this day could never even quantify, never describe the mysteries of the body as vast as the mysteries of the universe and the solar system, which literally we contain inside ourselves made of the dust of earth and stars. Hmm. Love making is truly that, truly that is this love making. Creation itself was an act of love the creator desiring to see itself reflected. That's why, as I always say, we cannot see our own faces except through a mirror, a camera, <laughs> a phone. Most importantly, through the eyes of another human being, our very first mirrors when we first came out of the womb. We saw our faces in the, in the eyes of our mother or our father. We only see ourselves truly through the reflection of another and vice versa. And that is why we love our neighbor as ourselves, as the Bible commands. Because they are our divine reflections, our divine mirrors. And we are meant to see ourselves in them, in their eyes, in their soul. The eyes are the windows of the soul. And thus, as the scripture also says, we see through a mirror darkly or with obscurity, which means we don't, it's cloudy. We don't necessarily see it clearly through the limitations of our human understanding, our, our material understanding, our egoic understanding. That's the right word I'm looking for. But soon face to face, meaning soon we will comprehend through that progressive, that process of denouncing the ego and its false illusions of duality and separation, soon face to face we will see that we all are each other. We all are the creator united. <laughs> um, I digress. So 
you know, all of that, although it may seem like a tangent from the original topic, it is. That is what orgasm is. That is what lovemaking is. And that is the pleasure we seek to access of which clitoral orgasm is only the initiation. It's only step one in a multi-step, multi-orgasmic process to deeper pleasure. The clitoral orgasm is functional in a very physical way, a very meticulously ordered way. The clitoris is not just that pearl that many of us think of. It goes deep inside the womb, deep inside the yoni, deep inside the body, connecting to so many neural pathways and, and nervous system synapses activated by its stimulation like acupuncture, just just touching the clitoris in certain ways can literally heal certain organs and parts of your body, wounds inside your body you didn't know were there. With intention, the clitoris is far more all-encompassing than we ever give it credit for. And it is functional. It is the first step in a multi- orgasmic, even multi-dimensional process of awakening to deeper pleasure and intuition and embodiment and divinity. It is even useful for fertility. I will explain step-by-step step how the clitoral orgasm is just the beginning and is functional in softening and opening the womb to be able to receive penetration on a deeper level without pain and with full pleasure, full arousal, which then produces the optimal cervical fluid, which invites the strongest and most ideal sperm in to fertilize the most ideal egg that has been released. So oftentimes infertility or the inability to conceive may be linked to an inability to orgasm and to reach those deeper depths of pleasure and opening more mindfully. Clitoral orgasm is very useful in childbirth and labor and delivery. As a doula, we are taught to um, encourage clitoral and nipple stimulation to release oxytocin, to soften the cervix, to initiate uterine contractions. And the sexual process of man and woman is just a reflection of the birth process. And that is another thing I will get into much deeper in this course. The Bible, uh, there was a great teacher who asked the Messiah, uh, oh, yeah, that most people know as Jesus Christ. He asked the Messiah, Yeshua, or some say Yehusha, Yehoshua, Yeshua, the beloved. He asked him, you know, how can a, a, a man be born again? Should he go and return back into his mother's womb? Thinking that physically as a man, he was supposed to just bundle up and get back into his mother's womb in the literal sense. But in a sense, through sexual alchemy, that is possible to be reborn again in the waters of the womb. That's one of the reasons I think men seek so insatiably for women. That their whole lives are a quest for union with women, to enter that womb again. That's the journey back to the beginning. We as women are cyclical, we know that. Men are linear and they always go out, again, back to the hero's journey archetype. Um, that we see in every film, we read in every book. We know the journey. The journey outside is really the journey back in. The journey for the treasure, the holy grail, the 
the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter, or whatever. You know what I you know what I mean. The journey <laughs> of every movie and book and fairy tale is really a journey outward. And then the hero realizes it's a journey back into himself. So men in their linearity, they seek to accomplish great deeds and go out into the world and make something of themselves and discover something outside of themselves, like their penis that directs them outside because it hangs out of their body, right? Um, <laughs> but they find ultimately that the journey is back within that what they have really claimed, the treasure they have really claimed <laughs> is the character that has been cultivated through the journey, whether learning their capacity for patience, endurance, um, discipline, all these things. And of course, it's not limited to just men. I'm just using them because they are wired in a very linear way to seek answers externally, then to find them confirmed internally whereas women we are already so internal so introspective and intuitive because our wombs are inside our bodies and they are circular cyclical so we know the end from the beginning the beginning from the end already <laughs> you know we see things in the spirit before we can even prove them or flesh them out um in the prophetic to see the end at the beginning. Um, but ultimately the man finds that his desire to enter a woman sexually is his desire to return to that maternal softness where he can be vulnerable. And sadly, the way Western society is built and, and even more tragically, the world now is becoming indoctrinated to this Westernism, Westernization, and Europeanization, Eurocentrism, this, this mass global hegemony. Um, and so unfortunately, many men are uh, not afforded opportunities to be vulnerable, except when inside a woman. That's why it should be so treasured. We, we should be honored uh, to allow men to be vulnerable in that space when they meet with us, when they meet within us and understand that we are not to mother them, but in being their divine lovers, we give them that space and softness to return to that feeling of maternal nurturing that they have sought all their lives. Um, so yes, <laughs> I just digressed into that beautiful path. Uh, however, to come back on the main path of clitoral orgasm, we give honor to the pleasure that is accessible through that, that deepening and opening when we allow ourselves in perfect love and trust to open more be more vulnerable and that's what clitoral orgasm does it leads us to the point of being able to open and soften many women in fact um can begin foreplay and aren't even fully aroused and literally some women do not even release arousal fluid or wetness until they have reached a clitoral orgasm but unfortunately many women think that's the end when really you just got started honey <laughs> you just started getting juicy and um, a man who has the capacity to continue past the woman's clitoral orgasm um, will find the many depths um, and limitless capacity she has for a multi-orgasmic nature. And each orgasm deepens um, her softness and her ability to achieve more profound levels of pleasure, more healing levels of pleasure more awakening levels of pleasure and presentness. So I hope that this has made you more curious about this offering, this course that I'm offering. And 
I would like to extend for those who have reached the end of this video a surprise, <laughs> a surprise discount. So if you've reached the end of this video genuinely and took the time to watch this full video, I am offering a 40% discount on both the clitoral orgasm course overcome as well as the journey to orgasm coaching container so if you've watched this video so i know that you've watched it i ask you for two things to answer one question you tell me what the proper name of that flower is <laughs> that you blow and make a wish. And you tell me the name of the person who came up with the theory of genital armoring. And when you reach out to me in my email, which I'll leave in the comments below, I will offer you that special 40% discount on both of those courses. And you can choose which container you'd like to enter. So thank you. Thank you for being present and hearing more about my newest offering. And I may make another video, maybe even a Q and A. If you have questions, you can add them as well. And I would love to respond and make a follow up. Hope to see you all in this beautiful container. And remember you always have the choice and opportunity to access deep pleasure in every single moment. Mm. <laughs> Blessings of bliss.